Is that enough to get me copyright striked? I don't know. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Let's Debate, the show where I jump off of Anthony Fantano's idea for the music industry and bring it for... That's... Don't do that. And bring it for books! You put controversial hot takes. I respond to them. We have a discussion. Let's go! First and foremost, I actually would like to continue the debate for the most controversial uh, of the uh, responses from one of my recent episodes of Let's Debate, where I put forward the idea that objective review does not exist. It's not a thing. You can't be have an objective review. All of it is subjective. A lot of people pushed back on that, saying like, well, grammar, punctuation, <sighs> okay, first of all, I think it's weird that people go to grammar and punctuation to try and prove this point because so many reviews so heavily focus on grammar and punctuation. But okay, let's talk about this a little bit more. Okay, 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 all right. So I have a book. I send it off to five different editors. You know what I'm gonna get back? Five different sets of edits because even this angle is subjective. There are editors out there who will tell you, hey, uh, actually, even though you technically should use a colon here, this is high fantasy and colon's gonna take a lot of readers out of like the high fantasy feel, so we're gonna do something else instead. Or they'll have another one over here who's gonna tell you to do this, and you're gonna have one who says like, oh, f this sentence all together, get rid of it. It's actually not as like hard line as you might think, even when it comes to these technical things. Different editors are going to edit your things differently. That's why it's not just some computer program you shoot your script through and then it just vomits back an edited copy. On top of that, a lot of people were like, well, there's these hard rules for a reason. Yeah, but these rules shift and change. It's not like Shakespeare wrote the exact same standards of English that we have today. It's a wishy, wibbly, wobbly, rah, evolving thing and okay, Okay, what if you're someone who learned all about like the rules in the 80s and you're not applying all the rules as they are now? Well, then you're not going to use hashtags correctly, are you? Not exactly relevant for books, but it's an example of how these things can grow and evolve. There's also the pushback that the people who made these rules are a bunch of flawed monkeys because that's what human beings are. We're flawed little monkeys who learn to wield electricity and... I completely and utterly justify going. I ignore all their rules because they're flawed. I don't like them and they don't service my art. And art is completely subjective. Books, scripts, screenplays, entirely. I'm not saying you shouldn't criticize. Absolutely you can and I promote that because it's how I make my living. But just the idea that objectively wrong it just doesn't exist, and that's an opinion, a subjective one. You're allowed to have a different one, but the irony of that kind of helps my case. So, yeah, even those hard-lying technical things can come up to a lot of pushback. Even like, oh, this plot, I didn't like it because it has a giant plot hole right there. There's going to be people who say, I don't care, and if actually you took the time to fill in that plot hole, I think it would have detracted from the pacing I liked. So I think it's my subjective truth that it's good that that plot hole exists because it allowed the pacing to move this certain direction. I'm not saying there aren't things that are like clearly, obviously bad. And it's honestly, it's okay to say something's objectively bad if you really, really dislike it as a way to like emphasize and put down a point. But I do think because in my personal belief, all of reality is this gigantic, what the f we don't even know. Are we real? Ah! So it's really ludicrous to like go down to this like hard line and say this piece of art objectively good and or bad depending on the statement you're making. I just don't buy into that because I just don't think hard rules exist really for almost anything. And then, you know, okay, whose definition of these rules are you pulling from? Because there's multiple people who put out definitions of this stuff and it's like, how long are you going with that one over there? Are you going with this one? I don't know. But yeah, I think there are things that you can say are like more widely accepted to be the wrong practice that's being practiced, but I don't know. I just don't believe in objective review. And that's just because I'm like a nihilistic, nothing matters, we're all gonna die, everything's wibbly wobbly, there's no purpose to anything person. But I'm really happy with that. Also, if you look into like a lot of the big name reviewers out there who have written books about like the review process, many of them will kind of make the case that like objective review is not a thing. And you can even remember back to a time on the channel where I said I was trying to be more objective in review. Around that time, I started reading books by like well-known reviewers and like different blog posts and opinion pieces. And almost all the ones I respected were like, that's not a thing. You can't, you can't do that. It's just not a thing really. But let's go ahead and get into today's episode. Yeah. All right. I am trusting you guys to have upvoted the most controversial opinions. So I'm doing top comments first. I made it really clear right here, not the people commenting easy popular opinions, okay? Am I threatening you with a knife? Maybe a little bit, but let's go ahead and get into this debate. There's not nearly enough physical 
maiming in stories. Lots of people get out fine or just die, but have few persistent lifelong injuries that are either immediately restified or glossed over. And with how dangerous fighting is as a whole, this seems odd to me. I probably lean more fantasy with this comment, but I still think it holds. I'm adding a heart to this right now. You are absolutely right. And a lot of people seem to agree with you, but apparently a lot of authors don't. Do you hear that authors? maim your characters. This is something I appreciate every single time I see it. I'm not going to get into specific spoilers, but whether it's Dresden, Game of Thrones, Wheel of Time, when characters get like maimed, it just invests me in them so much more. I really appreciate it when authors will actually put like a long lasting uh, damage to their character and maybe something they can eventually get over through like, you know, physical therapy or something over a long period of time. But if you want to get me hooked on in to the stakes of a fight later on in the series, if you show me earlier on that you'll maim a character for the rest of your series, I am more interested in your fight scenes because I know, well, maybe this character might not die, but he could poke his eye out. He could poke that little eye out. All right, sorry, that probably really did bother a lot of people. Hot take. If your hot take comment has triple digits in likes, it's not a hot take, at least in this community. Edit, please, guys, don't do this. Have mercy. Edit, God damn it! you have become the very thing you serve to destroy. <laughs> um, I actually do disagree with the core concept behind this concept here, because a lot of people could read something and then realize, oh, this is something I maybe haven't necessarily thought before, but is completely true and change their opinion on it and give you that own little low like there. Or they're going through and, as I said, upvoting the actual hot takes. So, you know. Boop, stoop, ba, doop, boop. Horses aren't cars. Fantasy authors need to stop treating them like they are. I know there are a few exceptions to this, but they are in the vast minority. So, <sighs> this is a thing that I'm actually going to push back against you on because here, I think you're right. I think horses are not cars. If you try and put a gas hose in a horse, it's gonna be really upset. Uh, I don't want that level of realism in my story. I don't want the whole plot to go on hold because the horse is tuckered out. And so we're gonna spend like four chapters just like, I gotta walk my horse because it can't, can't gallop that long. So take it to a watering hole. That's gonna be this whole chapter. The horse going to a watering hole. Ah, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, we need to go save that princess, but I'm, I'm just gonna sit here while my horse takes a big old poopy because that just isn't like narratively awesome. It just doesn't provide the narrative thrust I necessarily want forward. So you are technically right, but my subjective, tying it into my first argument here, opinion is that this just kind of, I don't know, it, it would be uh, too detrimental to the thrust of the story going forward, and that's important to me. And there are going to be people who disagree. They want realism in all cases, and that's fine. Pips the Cat is actually behind the Daniel Green channel. That's why he gets so much screen time. He doesn't get that much screen time. I'll edit in right now a photo of Pips. Boom, go, there you go. Oh, it's, I'm just going to make it my green screen now that I think about it. Hey, Pips. <laughs> Rubbing a knife on my cat. Modern fantasy has taken a turn towards realism, and as such tends to focus on humans almost solely rather than dealing with other classical races slash species, dwarves, elves, hobbits, etc. I'd love to see more modern fantasy examine these classical races slash species through a more modern, uh, more realistic lens. How would an underground dwarf society actually work? How would such long lifespans affect the elf society and things like that? Right now, I feel like they're either ignored completely or just end up playing out the same tropes. I somewhat disagree. There are definitely still a lot of fantasy books being published that have these things going on. I just don't think they're as popular. So I don't think the way you phrased it is quite right in a sense where it's not that modern fantasy doesn't have them. It's more that modern fantasy fans aren't rise, raising them up. It's kind of one of the same. I'm splitting hairs here, but I, I kind of agree where I would like to see like an Abercrombie take on a Lord of the Rings type continent where we have all these different races the 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 memory card got full even though i erased it it just has this thing where it doesn't actually erase and then the video got cut off but instead of getting all upset i'm just gonna be like you know what no big deal let's continue on and that's all right even though now it's gonna make my editing a little bit harder no big deal let's continue another person doing the standalone hot take which everyone has always said before sorry but we've seen that one many times yes more standalone books would be nice all right let's go ahead and get into some of these less upvoted hot takes to get to the real spicy opinions because these are not super controversial. The chosen one trope isn't 
any more overdone than other tropes. It's just easy to spot. Ridiculing it is equivalent to making fun of Bieber a few years ago. It's just done to look cool and be a part of the quote elite. <sighs> You're not entirely wrong. The chosen one trope is super spottable, but I think that what's really the crux though is we see the chosen one trope do in so much very popular media. It's done as much, I'd say, as many other tropes, but it seems to be much more done in the really popular stuff. So it's kind of just like more in the face, even though it's done just about as much as a lot of other stuff too. But I also am not gonna devalue people who are just tired of this trope and genuinely don't like it anymore. That's okay. I fell into that for a little bit. Now I'm kind of softer on it because it's just, you know, how much am I reading it? How much am I not reading it right now? I'm not gonna say it's some kind of snobbery to dislike the chosen one trope. No, you can genuinely not like that. I'm okay with it. I'm tired of character development being held up on a pedestal. People being stuck in their ways in refusing to change is the norm, not the exception. I do believe that it is kind of rare to see people change uh, quickly in day-to-day -day life, but I'm going to say once again, no, because character development kind of tends to lead to better storytelling. It's inherently interesting to see someone change and evolve. And it's most often kind of understandable or excusable for the stories being told because in real life, if someone's going to change, it's likely to happen during a time of great turmoil or unrest, some craziness. And that's, you know, what most books are. You're hardly following someone in their day to day. So I think no, because developing characters is more interesting and also it's very justified in the inherent environment of storytelling. But I have said in the past, and I will agree here with you, that characters don't always need to develop to be interesting. I've said that many times and the example everyone started using was James Bond. So boom, there you go, James Bond, interesting character. Doesn't change much, except for the Daniel Craig Ruby. That that really changed him. The male gaze in Dresden is an accurate depiction of what it's like to be in a youngish guy's head. I've actually used a similar defense for the Dresden Files repeatedly, and I still maintain it, that I don't think the Dresden Files is sexist because female characters have tons of agency and are constantly out on their own, making their own choices, very strong. But I mean, it's just really, you're in the first person perspective of a youngish guy. And I think it also kind of follows along the line of as Dresden gets older, as we get deeper in this series, that gets held back a lot. It's also justified through the sense that it's a supernaturally hot environment. He's literally around like sex demons and succubuses and vampires a lot. So yeah, he's going to be like, oh my God, they're beautiful. Though I will say, even though I'm largely in agreement with you, I can see how this would be annoying to some people. Not everyone wants to sit in the head of a young horny dude for book after book. Um, that's totally a preference people can have, I guess. But yeah, in general, I agree. I don't think Dresden's sexist and it's just a part of his character. Before reading, I was promised by endless reviews on the internet that Pet Cemetery will be one of the scariest books I've ever read. As a non-horror fan who can't even finish a horror movie because I'm getting afraid too easily, I found only the dark atmosphere quite nice, but that's it. As a book, it's a great book. As I said, King has written a great atmosphere and good characters and relationships, but as a horror book, pass. I agree. I don't know why on the internet people keep saying Pet Cemetery is so scary. It ain't that scary, boy. I don't even think I said it was that scary in my review. I think I even said it was more just like suspense. Well, it is very effective in evoking grief within me due to the loss of some people in my own life. But no, I do not agree with the people who say Pet Cemetery is uh, a really scary book. I can, mm, okay, if someone is a parent or can just super relate to the loss of a loved one, I think there's a really emotional type of fear there, but that's it. And we don't often associate emotional fear with horror. So it's kind of a, you can make the case situation. Elf is one of the best fantasy movies of all time and should be considered as such. Booktubers always complain about stuff in books that the average reader won't realize. One of it is authors when they repeat a description numerous times in a book. Y'all get annoyed because you read a book in a day. The average reader doesn't, and numerous descriptions of the same thing are needed, especially if you read two to three chapters a night. Well, it seems like you're kind of on the opposite extreme of quote unquote, the reader crowd. If you're only reading one to two, a whole like 24 hour cycle, I think that's a little bit lower than most people. Maybe my view is very skewed, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, a lot of us do kind of realize that kind of stuff, but I'm not gonna leave it out. I mean, I'll put that on the, the review watcher to realize like, hey, if I'm saying this, it's, it's up to you. I'm doing this whole other job on this end. Now you need to do the job of being like, all right, that's not really applicable to me. But also you have to realize that there are people out there who even if they're not booktubers do 
blaze through books and you know they'll also see it too so i think it's fair that i have it available and ready to be criticized as well for that audience too hot take i'm starting to dislike brandon sanderson i've read stormlight archive and i've read mistborn up to the middle of the third book the thing is i actually loved the first book of both series the kind of omg this is one of the new favorite series love then the second books were still really good and then i couldn't finish the third book of mistborn it took me like two months to get through the third book of stormlight archive because i either got bored or angry at how story was at how the story was progressing i just don't like how sanderson gets so philosophical and religious in the later books and i don't like how the characters evolve i'm actually really sad because everyone loves sanderson so much and a lot of people say the books just get better and better the further you read and go along but for me it's literally the opposite here is an actual hot take but it's one we've kind of had similar things before usually when i do these videos there's quite a few people who push back against the sanderson popularity because it's extraordinarily popular he's not going to be everyone's cup of tea. Uh, but the specific points you bring up around like religion philosophical, I don't think Sanderson is extraordinarily philosophical. Maybe you haven't read the same stuff I have, but compared to a lot of like the sci-fi I'm used to and like what I'm reading around and Anthem, not, not even calling, calling Stormlight Archive philosophical when you read certain things is just new. But if the bits of philosophy he does have in there do bother you, that's okay. It's a personal preference. It's amazing how much I have to tell people it's okay not to like Sanderson. When it comes to religion, I see this brought up a lot. People accusing Sanderson of weaving his religion into his books, and I'm sorry, objectively, <laughs> Subjectively, I just don't see it there. Maybe you're picking up on things I missed, but I don't see him preaching in any way, shape, or form any more than any other fantasy author does who happens to have their own made-up religion uh, in their books. If all of a sudden he started having like some John Smith stuff, yeah, I'd be a bit... Ah, but he hasn't done that. And so for now, I'm really okay with how he handles it all. It actually feels a lot less religious to me than certain well-known authors like Tolkien, who wrote like very Christian influenced bits into their mythology. So I don't know, this is just gonna come down to it bothers some people about this and bother others, but I just don't see all the time the people that it bothers point and that's okay. But I do in general, despite my love for the author, agree with a lot of the Sanderson criticisms that do come about. He does have his formulas he likes to stick to. His prose are not the strongest, but he's working on that apparently. Um, but you know, it's okay to criticize and enjoy. And I hope that you eventually grow to like Sanderson more or move on and find another author that will fill that gap for you. I got a lot of recommendation videos. Check them on it. I hate when people make a top 10 and include classics like The Lord of the Rings or Foundation just because they're classics. A top 10 should be your personal favorites and not the classics. If you genuinely feel that these should be in your top 10, that's fine. However, many people include these classics out of pressure. And I think it's really transparent when some people do. And if I'm gonna be honest, my last top 10 video where I had Lord of the Rings in the top, the only reason it was really included there was I had just reread it and was really into Tolkien's prose and was just vibing with it really hard. And I also want my top 10s to always be shifting and adjusting to really push on the idea that I like to put my audience that it's okay to have an opinion that changes and evolves. Uh, but I, I, I do see what you're talking about and I hate, hate when someone says like, well, my top 10 isn't a personal top 10. These are the ones that are the best for the genre. And it's like, that, no. <laughs> to do that, you would need to like come together with the top critics of all time, the top authors of all time, do a whole lot of like argh, debate and stuff. And then even then, it's debatable. There's no definitive top 10 for any genre. I guess this is like the theme of this, let's debate. That just can't exist, it's not possible. A bunch more of the Brandon Sanderson is overrated comments. We're gonna scroll past those. A couple of round world building we've done before. I'm fine with characters making mistakes and stupid decisions, but they need to have consequences for them. That's pretty, that's not, that's not controversial. If Legolas and Gimli hadn't counted their kills, Sauron would have won. <laughs> Fantasy should have more non-human protagonists. That's not a popular opinion. People love that. Some of the best fantasy books are written in languages other than English, but because there is almost no demand for them, it takes more than a huge success for them to get any kind of translation. Example, Witcher. It's actually becoming more and more easy to have a book translated now, thankfully because of the day and age of the internet. Uh, there's a lot of people who are just like for hire online who will do this kind of stuff for you. So to me, it's more of the, uh, we need good translations because just because you hire some dude online doesn't mean it's going to be translated well. And then you also essentially have to basically repackage and remarket it. And that's all kind of an issue. And there's also just like spheres of, okay, this book will become known in the US, which means it'll probably become known in Canada, which means it'll probably become known in the UK, but then like, oh, breaking into 
other places that have language barriers and stuff is going to be like a hurdle. And if some people find great success, their publisher will push them beyond. But pretty much every author I know of, if they really want to do and have had any real substantial success, could get their book translated. In fact, I just saw Nicholas Eames put on Twitter, apparently he didn't know his book had had a recording put up on Audible in another language. So it's reaching the level where it can just apparently happen. So I disagree. I don't think it's the fact that it's not that enough books are being translated. I actually think it's kind of getting over a hurdle of marketing where you need to then market to a whole new audience. That's a lot of work and the hype maybe hasn't bled over into here as much. So like going from the US to Canada, super easily. Going from the US to Saudi Arabia, really difficult because you have to market it in a whole different way to appeal to a different culture and kinds of stuff. And it's, it's, it's a lot. So it's something that some people just choose not to do. Betrayals can be dumb. Sometimes it's just, they were bad all along and they're going to be bad for the rest of the story. Sometimes the betrayal completely overrides all the good things that the character did, which is pretty harmful. If they were your favorite character and you have invested a lot of emotion in them, I can think of multiple examples of what you're talking about. And it's like, stop this, especially when like you can go back through the book and it's like, then it makes no sense for them to have not just killed the protagonist and accomplished everything they wanted to at this point if they actually were serving the bad guy the whole time. There's just this plot armor around it and it makes gigantic annoying plot holes in your story. Some people could prefer the character twist, I guess, and just ignore this, but I know exactly what you're talking about. It bugs me too. And this is actually probably a bit more of a hot take because I think there are enough people who are like pure character-based readers who will pick up on the slight hints the author will put in this person's gonna betray and say that outweighs the like possible plot negation. It's gonna come down to like, which one do you prefer? Uh, but for me, I'm in agreement with you. Stop doing lazy betrayals. If you're gonna do a betrayal, it needs to be one of the most tactfully laid out and just combed through lines in your story to make sure it doesn't conflict, in my opinion, with anything. And I think if you're going to go, and, and I also think you should probably plant quite a bit of seeds, but not a lot of authors do that really well. Anyway, this has been your latest episode of Fantasy News. No wait, fantasy hot takes or debate, whatever I call it. I hope you're having a wonderful week, guys. Like and subscribe. If you have not already, hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here. Check out the A Fictional Conversation podcast in the link down below. If you'd like to listen to my friend and I talk about Back to the Future, and have a good one, y'all.